here, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Under the Radar, and I am really excited today because I have not one, but two representatives from ICAR. Scott Caboose, who is the OEM Collision Repair Technical Lead with ICAR, and Jeff Poole, who is the Lead Subject Matter Expert with ICAR. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks Good for being be here. here. So let's get right into it. When did ICAR first see a great need for 8S training in the industry? When did they see this locomotive coming down at the, the tracks at us at a high rate of speed? And we went, oh my God, we need this. When did that happen? So the, the subject matter expert team here and all of the technical people behind the scenes, um, we've been monitoring this and keeping tabs on it for many, many years. Um, if I look back through some of the ICAR course history, um, this goes back beyond 2010, but right, right in 2010, we released a course called New 10. And we started development on that in 2009. And within that course, we started to bring out some of the technologies in front of the industry that we're seeing very predominant today. Uh, kind of that first glimpse and helping the industry get ready for it. Now, that wasn't a deep dive into the technical topics, but that was a piece of that particular course that, that lived on through the years um, to, to help the industry get ready and, and give them that heads up on what's coming. Um, more in depth, we really started about six years ago looking at very specific courses that started to break the technology down and help the industry understand what they're facing. Wow, so 2010, that was a long time ago. And uh, you said just recently, or well, six years ago, you started getting more in depth so tell me how successful these courses have been. I mean, are they sold out? Uh, are, are, are the collision repairs coming in droves to either take these courses virtually or in person? How successful has this course offering been? So we have a combination of courses. Most of our 8S courses are available online. And we, we pulled some numbers uh, knowing that we were going to be on the show today. And it even surprised me. There's actually been over 60,000 individual ADAS courses taken through ICAR. And I was shocked. And that represents a huge part of our industry. Um, and that's, that's individual people that have taken at least one ADAS course. And there's 1,500 people that are actually enrolled as ICAR ADAS learners, which means they are on the path to becoming platinum certified or have already achieved that in the ADAS role. So those are the ones that are really serious about doing ADAS and becoming fully certified in ADAS with us. Wow, that, that's really impressive. And uh, you know that gives me some assurance and I'm sure the industry has some assurance that we are doing some things right here. And because after all, we're talking about safety systems, right? So. Um, and my, my next question is, based on these courses you offer, um, are, are you seeing a, a, a need? Is there one course that's more popular than another? And does that indicate maybe where there is a shortfall in, in a certain skill set uh, with repairs as far as ADAS? For example, I mean, is, is scanning um, something that they uh, desperately need? Or is it calibration that they're more... Uh, Need, needful of. Is there any indication of where, where, the, where repairers need the training? So as I look, think about that question and um, our, our courses, uh, ultimately uh, scanning seemed to be the hot button um, right before uh, ADAS as the hot button in the industry. And you know, ultimately it all goes hand in hand as it's, it's all connected. But, um, you know, I, I don't I don't like to think of it as I want to say deficiencies in the industry, but it's it, it's understanding where we have the expertise in house in our business um, and coming to terms with, you know, how are we going to manage that and whether whether a business is doing the ADAS calibrations in house or not. There's still a need if they're touching that vehicle, there's still a need for them to understand the implications of every aspect of work that gets done to that vehicle. 
and how it potentially can impact the function of those ADS features that are on that vehicle. So um, as, as I look at, at our curriculum, what we've tried to do with the courses that we offer is try to break it down in, in those modular increments. So folks, no matter what, um, what role they play in the industry, what their job function is in the industry, um, they can get up to speed on the different technologies that are out there. And hopefully then they can make better decisions on how they're going to handle that particular vehicle and the repairs on that vehicle. That way, whenever that vehicle is finished, they've got a complete and safe repair. So you have your current offering of ADAS courses. Is there anything coming down the pipeline uh, in the future that, that is perhaps being developed right now that you can talk about uh, to address yet more uh, training? So the, the most recent additions that we've had are, of course, the hands-on live. Um, the uh, dynamic uh, course, which is more of a diagnostic approach uh, with the Ford vehicles that we have, and the static, which we have four different brands of vehicles that we use in that for the static calibrations. And those are very comprehensive um, events, if you will, that are conducted down at the Chicago Tech Center. Um, to say that we've got something else in development at the moment uh, we don't, but at the same time, we're always monitoring and looking at what's happening out there. What are the true needs of the industry? And we are prepared to move forward on whatever is relevant and necessary to help the industry uh, keep pace with the evolution of this technology. You mentioned the Ch Chicago Technical Center. Let's talk about that. What an amazing facility. I've seen the photos. We've done some coverage uh, of when it was, the ribbon was cut on it. Um, I mean, it is really impressive. How has that facility taken your ADAS training to the next level? So, so that facility was a big investment for the industry as a whole, and it's, it's something we're very proud of. Um, ultimately, having a facility like that where folks can come in and actually get that hands-on experience to be able to touch and work with the vehicles. I was very fortunate that each of the vehicles that's down at the Chicago Tech Center, um, it started its life with ICAR up at the Appleton Tech Center where I'm based. And uh, while we're a much smaller facility, uh, we did a tremendous amount of research and I'll say testing. And we learned a lot about ADAS, how the systems behave, how the vehicles behave, um, some of the things that can go wrong during the calibration process. and you know, as, as we worked with these vehicles, again, we're very fortunate to be able to work with them in a more controlled environment and then evaluate, okay, if, if we're sitting here going through a calibration process and we're struggling with something, uh, we're getting on the phone with a technical expert out there, perhaps from an OEM or something of that nature, and saying, hey, what was the intention of the interpretation of this at this stage in this calibration? In some cases, we found some um, some procedures that were rather ambiguous, and we got some clarifications. And uh, a couple of cases, we found where there were some minor technical errors in the in the technical documents, and we worked with the OEMs to take and correct those. But th those are some of the key pieces as we look at um, doing those calibrations, um, talking about them, watching a video on them. You know, th that's helpful. Going through an ICAR course on them, that's an online course, all helpful but actually physically going out there and doing it. It's, it's difficult to, I'm going to say, put a price on that per se, on the, on the confidence that it builds, the experience that it builds for those technicians. And it's just tremendous. So one neat thing about that uh, three-day hands-on class where you do the static aiming, you're going to spend just a couple hours in a classroom getting some background in theory, and then you're going to spend the rest of the three-day period out in the shop, working on the cars. You're gonna use the OEM tools, you're gonna to use the OEM service information, and you're gonna do real calibrations on real cars. And you have opportunities to make mistakes with an instructor looking over your shoulder and guiding you throughout that process and saying, okay, if you had done this, this might've been what would have happened and then bring you back to the service information and show you where you missed 
a link or an issue or a problem and drive you back to that and allow you to restart. And it, it's really a confidence builder where, where you do that for a whole day, where you're day and a half, really, where you're just practicing, practicing, practicing. You're doing multiple systems on multiple makes and models. And then day three, you're going to be tested and you're going to be asked to perform those solo. And it it's a little nerve wracking. Uh, I went through the pilot of it and you get to day three and you're like, oh, yeah, Subaru does it this way. Oh, yeah, Nissan does it that way. Oh, no, there's a Honda. That one we got to do that way. And it, it's really driving you to be very granular with the service information and understand each Manufacturers a little different. Everybody does it differently. There's different tools and equipment and none of them are hard. They're just very detailed and it's very easy to miss or skip a step. And it's, it's challenging. I don't know, hard. I First time I did a few of them, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then after doing it a few times, it's like, oh, okay, now I understand what they're after, what, right. what, what they're shooting for here. And I think that was the big key for me as, as I go out there and I, I do something like that. You know, um, after you've done the variety of them, though, it does make it easier to digest whenever you get to that next one. OK, what are they looking for? What are we doing here um, as we as we read through those procedures? How, how many technicians are taking advantage of coming to the Chicago Technical Center? As we know, in this industry, one of the issues of, with training is I don't have the time, you know, I don't have the uh, luxury of sending technicians all out of the shop because that's time that they're not working. And, you know, that's been an issue. So tell me, you know, how many technicians, how many shops are sending their technicians to your Ch Chicago Technical Center for this training? Do you have numbers on that, Jeff? Or I, I don't have the raw numbers on that at this point in time. I know that we've been running the classes regularly down there. Um, but I don't know what the specific numbers are at this point. What what uh, what do you know? What percentage of technicians are taking hands-on courses with ADAS versus virtual? I mean, I'm sure there's some courses that you have to do in person. I would imagine. Um, um, yeah, majority of our ADAS courses right now are online courses, and that's where the big numbers are. And that leads up, and and most of those, I'm going to say, online courses are prerequisites before you can take either the dynamic or the static at the Chicago Tech Center. Yeah, so even to be allowed to go to the Chicago Sec Center and take the hands-on course, uh, you have to take 11 prerequisite online courses. So there's a lot of people that have enrolled in the hands-on course, but they're still taking the prerequisites and waiting to complete them. We won't let them actually pick a date until they've completed all their prerequis prerequisites for it. And is there gold and, and platinum uh, labels attached to this training? I know there is in other areas of, of training you do. Yeah, so in April of 22, so just last year, we launched an ADAS role. And there's three pro levels to it, just like there are with all of our other roles. So pro level one, two, and three. And if you are able to complete all three pro levels successfully, you will reach platinum level and be platinum certified in ADAS. And that's the first time we've offered that was in April of 22. And this hands-on course is the capstone of that training. You mentioned the, the, the classes you've created, you know, are from years of experience uh, that you guys have. Are, are you finding now that, that there's a significant volume of technicians taking these, these classes are you finding ways to tweak the classes to be better for the technician? Are you, are you, is this sort of a trial and error for you as well to see are these courses uh, fulfilling what you want them to do or are you finding out better ways to, or better information to offer or better ways to conduct the courses? So, so as we developed the courses that we have, uh, we didn't do it in a silo. Uh, we worked with uh, some outside entities, some actual shops that are, that are at the forefront of doing this and other folks out there that are in the ADAS calibration space. And we were very fortunate to have a lot of uh, extremely knowledgeable folks in order to gather information and what they were seeing, the challenges they were seeing as well. So while we work with 
the industry and we're of the industry on the technical level, um, coming from shops and, and working in that environment and being able to work with the vehicles we've worked with. Uh, we also look to those outside folks where they would take and get in touch with us and share with us some of their experiences, some of the places they, some of the things they were seeing trouble with, problems with and challenges. And that helped us tremendously as we take and we develop the courses and the training that we do in order that um, we're as robust as we can be and as relevant as we can be and ensure that the, uh, the learner uh, walks away with and takes away uh, the technical knowledge and where the hands-on, the skills that they need in order to take and do these calibrations. And we even had the opportunity to go to quite a few shops and even other ADAS centers and learn from them. And, you know, how are they setting up their shops? How are they maintaining uh, business? How are they running their operations? Uh, what is a level floor? My goodness, that was, a, it's a crazy question to ask because, the OEMs say, do this on a flat level space. And no one really tells you how to create that flat level space. <laughs> and we found all kinds of interesting answers and ideas to that question. Yeah, yeah, we cover that in the magazine all the time, you know, a validated level surface. Well, what does that mean? You know, you can't just eyeball it, right? And you can't do yeah. it in, uh, in, in your... Um, detailed wash bay because there might be a two degree pitch, you know, and that could throw everything off. Um, but yeah, but that's a very, very important criteria, right? Well, one of the challenging things we're hearing about ADAS and, and these rolling computers that we're dealing with now is the information and the technology is changing so much, sometimes on a daily basis, weekly basis. Um, how, how is ICAR able to stay nimble and adapt to those, what seems like ever increasing uh, changes that happen uh, with the information, the OEM repair procedures, the technology that's coming out in these vehicles. Um, how, how is ICAR able to stay on top of that? So we spend a tremendous amount of time and, and uh, sometimes I call it those sleepless nights, uh, <laughs> um, researching OEM service information. And, and working with folks out there, uh, again, in the industry and from the OEM level that, uh, that help, help us stay informed on what's happening. Um, you know, we, we would be remiss if we didn't drive every technician working on every car out there, if we didn't say, you need to go look at the OEM service information for that car today. Not, not what you looked at last week, and maybe it's the same as last week. Maybe it's the same as it was a year ago. But I'm not going to bank on that. So as, as we look at developing courses, um, that's a challenge for us as an organization where we have general courses that will cover the technologies involved in some of the general procedures. But once you get to that specific make, model, and year, now we need to take a look at what's applicable to that car today for those repairs. And at that stamp in time, it's absolutely necessary that they are using the correct scan tool, targets, and service information in order to do that calibration. And we've no, also guys. really had a great opportunity this, even in the last year or two, to add some subject matter experts to the team. Uh, we've really spread our wings, if you will. Yeah, we have the strongest technical team at ICAR that we've ever had in the history of ICAR. Wow. We're in a different world, guys. Obviously, we know that. These are not our father's vehicles, right? And all of a sudden, it's very sobering realization to know that your 20 years or 25 years of experience as a technician may not amount to much today because cars have changed so much. So what would you say to the industry to emphasize the need for training? Because we are an, a training industry now, and, and, and it has never been more important. Yeah, th thinking about that question... It there there is a point in my career where I was a structural technician and I didn't pay attention to the technology too much. And this dates back quite a few years. But what I found is that at a point where I joined ICAR and that was in 2006, um, while I had kept up to some degree with some of what was happening in the technology sector, um, I hadn't kept up as much as I wished I would have. And 
as, as I joined the organization and was afforded the opportunity to start work, to work with a lot of, I'll say, outside entities, folks out there in the industry that are doing this on a daily basis and meeting the challenges. And that goes from diagnostics, electronic systems, and, and even at the forefront of the, the ADAS tsunami. Uh, ultimately, I realized, hey, I've got a pretty steep curve ahead of me. And I dove into it. I, I love the technology. I love the challenge. And as I, as I dove into that and worked with others in that arena, um, I found that, you know, at first it was a little daunting. But over time, um, for me, it's second nature now. A lot of it is. And I think that's the key. And we can't, we can't ignore it. We know that. And it's a matter of having the right mindset going in and a determination. And I think a lot of technicians have a lot of determination out there. Um, they've just got that ingrained in them. And, um, you know, accept the fact that it's not going away <laughs> and, and that we really need to, you know, be in touch with, and even if you're not doing those ADAS calibrations, if you're doing structural repairs on these cars if, or even cosmetic repairs, you know, what are the implications of what you're doing to that vehicle and how potentially are they affecting these systems? Because we at least need to know what questions to ask. Even if we don't, I want to say necessarily have the answer in-house in our business. Hopefully, though, we know what questions to ask so that we do, I'll say, take that responsibility of ensuring that, okay, this is what we've done. Now, how does that affect those systems and what else needs to be done to this vehicle? I think that's a great point, Jeff. The uh, ADAS system touches everyone in the body shop now. Right? And even the refinished technician we see now has got to pay attention to how much mill thickness can he put over top of a radar? What colors is he allowed to spray over a radar? There may be certain colors you're not even allowed to put a second refinish coat over. There may be some brands of paint that will work and other brands in the same color code that won't work. Right. So, I mean... You know, years ago, a painter would have never had to even worry about an ADAS system, and now they do. And, you know, structural technician, if it's not, a, if the body's not aligned with the drivetrain suspension and everything else, we may never be able to align that radar or camera because the car's not tracking true. And, you know, non-structural technician, if you're fixing a dent on a quarter panel, that quarter panel has damage that transferred under the bumper to where that radar mounts that angle might be off far enough that it's going to change the angle of that radar. You know, everyone in the shop is touching a car today that affects the ADAS system on that vehicle. And the biggest thing is know what you're doing and how, what effect it's having on that vehicle and what that's going to lead to later. Is it going to need a calibration because of what I did? You know, you see a lot of painters, hey, this is in my way. I'm going to paint the quarter all the way down. I'm just going to take this off and put it in the trunk. Well, that was the blind spot radar. Well, because you took it off out of your way, now it needs to be calibrated because we're going to put it back on. And something as simple as that can trigger calibration that may not have been on the original estimate, may not have been planned for in the uh, service time available for that vehicle in your shop, may not be a sublet that you planned on or scheduled. So there's a lot of things that affect the entire cycle of that repair. You know, it's interesting with the blind spots in particular, um, you know, what we've seen and, and some of the things that we've learned and, and um, with, with some of the blind spots, there's no required calibration. There's just an operational check and others, there are calibrations that are required. And, and again, it, it's just, it's all over the map so far as, you know, what are the actual requirements based on the work being done? But in every situation, what you'll find is that in many cases that there are assumptions that the body, body structure, frame, et cetera, are correct. Um, Scott and I were chatting the other day and it was, it's interesting when we start to compare notes on different things. And I like doing that with folks out in the industry too. And, you know, to, to understand, hey, where are folks potentially going wrong? And as we worked with the vehicles that we have, we actually have in our possession down at CTC, the Chicago Tech Center, um, it was interesting some of the things that we also observed and learned about the behavior of the systems and where, where sometimes we did a calibration that was, I'm going to say, kind of marginal, <laughs> and we did it on purpose that way. Um, we took the vehicle out 
and we got a passing grade on the calibration, even though we, we know we had done it off a little bit. And it took it a long time before it exhibited odd behavior and then actually presented us with some sort of a fault code or a drivability, some, some sort of a symptom that showed up. And it scared us a little bit. You know, it's just like, well, wait a minute. So I could potentially do this a little bit wrong and, and it's gonna give me a passing, it's gonna say calibration complete. And it takes it sometimes days or weeks before it actually, the system actually figures out, hey, something's off a little bit here. And it finally flags a code. Uh, again, it was interesting. We we would we would take some of these vehicles. <laughs> I got to be careful here. Uh, we would we would take some of these vehicles, and again, on purpose, we'd do the calibration off a little bit. Then I would have a driver, and I'd be sitting in the passenger seat. I'd have the OEM scan tool, and I'd be watching the live data on these systems. And and we would watch as it started to learn. I, I like to say, learn its new home. And in many cases, it would take hours and hours of driving before it figured out his new home was not right. And then it would fault out. I was like, huh, wow, that's, that's interesting. Um, again, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in these systems, the amount of data those sensors are collecting. Um, I, I have a lot of respect for the technology they've got on these vehicles. I mean, this, this comes from aerospace and military technologies that we have on our vehicles now. And it didn't just land here as, as the first round of, hey, let's put this cool technology on a vehicle. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, electronic engineering behind it all. And uh, while the systems are pretty robust, um, they're also, I'll say for the most part, most of these systems are continually learning and, and adapting within certain reason to, uh, to their driving conditions. And they have to in, order to, in to, in order to function under the dynamic conditions we have on the roads. So, um, you know, whenever we look at these systems, we're always pushing for the precision of the calibration. And these systems do have certain tolerances, but what we want to make sure of is, and we want to drive this message home, is make sure that what we do as a service provider, what we do for that customer, that it is as bulletproof as it can be, that we've eliminated every potential error in our calibration in our stall at our business, in order that we can then stand behind that and say, we did, see, did this per the OEM requirements and we have the correct calibration before it leaves our business. And then we've taken it out and given it a thorough road test and evaluated the operation of it. Where can repairers go to find out more about the, these ADAS courses? Uh, I'm sure the website, but is there a specific thing they should be looking for on the website, an area? Um, on the homepage, we do have uh, an ADAS specific um, homepage and we can provide that link. Um, that's easily accessible. And also within the RTS website, uh, the RTS website has an extremely informative um, ADAS link page that uh, pretty much takes the, uh, the interested party on that journey of what's available. And under the RTS banner, we've also got a tremendous amount of ADAS resource on the calibrations and when calibrations are necessary and different vehicle make model year lookups and things like that. Scott and Jeff, I want to thank you for coming on to Under the Radar today. I don't think I'm alone in the industry when I say that ICAR has done an amazing job over the last decade getting ahead of this technical tsunami so it doesn't plow us under, right? Um, I think you guys actually trademarked the term technical tsunami and what a technical tsunami it has been. But you guys have done an amazing job uh, with your course offerings, the, the various methods uh, by which to take the courses, the Chicago Technical Center. Um, we owe you a big thank you. Uh, and because and ultimately this is training our technicians and keeping vehicles on the road safe, which impacts everybody. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. And, you know, ICAR has a responsibility to the industry and we intend to keep moving ahead and monitoring the technologies that are out there, seeing what's coming down the pike and ensuring that we're evolving our training to meet those needs. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this episode of Under the Radar. For more episodes, visit BodyShopBusiness.com.